church, how you guys doing? Uh, like Kevin said, we have our junior high and high school ministry uh, attending with us today. Not all of them, but can we give it up for our youth ministry real quick? So good to see you guys. Uh, thanks for being in here. Uh, I'm excited that you joined us at church today on Memorial Day weekend. If we haven't met yet, my name is Jordan. Um, I'm one of the pastors here. I get to oversee the youth ministry, um, and I love it here in Arizona. If we haven't met, me and my wife, we moved down here about nine months ago, um, and it's just been incredible. We love Arizona. We love Gilbert, but we really, really love this church. We love you guys and the way that you believe in the next generation. Uh, that's the heartbeat around here, um, that we would see, that we believe Jesus changes everything for everyone, and that includes our youth. And so I love um, what God's been doing here. God's been moving in an amazing way uh, throughout our church, but also in our youth ministry in a huge way. We've had over 50 baptisms in our youth this school year. Uh, yeah. And we've just seen life change. Uh, we have amazing leaders who are dedicated um, to discipling our youth. So I, I love it here, um, needless to say, and it's been a blessing and an honor to be a part of. Um, like I said, we moved down here about nine months ago, and three months ago, we had our first child. His name is Rome. Uh, here's a picture of him. He's a little cutie. If you heard a baby crying, that was probably him, um, but I'm the preacher today, so it's okay. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's my fam, and if I've made any observation about living in Arizona, it's that I am more spiritual where it's sunny. It's been amazing, you know? Uh, Washington, it's nine, 10 months of rain and darkness and sadness, uh, so I'm a little bit better down here. But today, I actually get to wrap up the series that we've been in called Creatures of Habits, where we've been looking at habits that hold us back from God's best. And today, I wanna talk about pride. Now, I don't claim to know all the answers, but it'd be my hope today that I could point you to Jesus, that you would walk out of this place a little bit better, a little bit closer to Jesus, a little more hopeful for your future. So today, I'm talking about pride because I believe it's important. It actually is a big barricade that holds us back from walking in the abundance of God, walking in what he has is best for us. And I love how C.S. Lewis describes pride. He says this, for pride is spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even common sense. Pride is spiritual cancer. Here's what I know to be true about pride. It's difficult to detect and it's dangerously destructive. Pride is difficult to, to detect, and it's dangerously destructive. I have to admit, when I was looking at the speaker lineup for May, I was like, okay, I'm at the end of May. Who's before me? Steve Carter. Okay, sweet. Steve is an incredible communicator. If you know, if you know Steve or you don't know Steve, he's a great guy off and on the stage, but he's a really good storyteller. He's got charisma. He has good hair sometimes. He, he's funny. He, he's a great communicator. And I'm like, I have to follow him up? Well, this is great. This is great. I have to tell my best story. I have to be as funny as I can. I have to have a tweetable moment in church. What was happening is, is I was experiencing pride, that I was focused on how good I might sound instead of glorifying a good God, but needless, when I look at this and, and look at how I was prepping, it's okay to want to have a good message. It's okay to want to communicate well, but it's not okay to have a preacher who wants to magnify themselves over Christ. So in that moment, my pride, it was difficult to detect, but it was dangerously destructive. That's what pride is. Now, is all pride bad? Not necessarily. There's it's okay to be proud of your kids' sports. Maybe don't belittle the other Little League parents. <laughs> it's okay to be proud of your family. It's okay to be proud of your accomplishments. It's okay to be proud of your career, or the, the ways that God has blessed you. But there is sinful pride. And we look at sin sometimes, and we see the big ones like murder or stealing or lying, and we skip over pride. But the reality is, is that God hates pride. This is what Proverbs eleven twelve 12 says. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 16 says this, the Lord detests all the proud of heart. So it's safe to say that pride is not only a bad habit, 
but it's a deadly sin that's difficult to detect and dangerously destructive. What I love about Jesus is he was the greatest storyteller of all time. You know your fun, crazy uncle who can tell a good campfire story? Jesus puts him to shame. He tells amazing stories, and what I love is he uses his stories to get his point across. So oftentimes he would be frustrated with his disciples or the religious elite, and he would tell these stories to get his point across. And we can learn a lot from those stories. So today we're gonna focus our text in scripture. If you have physical Bible, if you don't, we'll have it up on the screen. We're gonna go to Luke chapter 18, and we're looking at a parable called the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. But before I get into God's word, I wanna pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for every person in this room. I pray that we realize Um, God, that you love us just as we are, but you love us too much to leave us where we are. So you wanna help us, God, that you you wanna be with us. And I pray that um, today we would be more encouraged. I pray that today we would fix our eyes on your son, Jesus. I pray that today your word would speak to us in new ways. God, this is your word, not my word. So God, I pray that you speak through me to your people. It's in Jesus' mighty name and all of God's people said, amen, amen. So Luke chapter 18, Jesus um, addresses Um, who he's telling this story for. And it's really for people who experience pride. So I wanna look at that first verse. It says this, uh, to to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Now I wanna pause here for a second. To some who were confident in their own righteousness, so lacking a dependence on God, but their own performance, their own righteousness, and somebody who looked down on everybody else. I think it's important for us to define what sinful pride is. We talked about how not all pride is bad. Some, some is good, but there is sinful pride. And I wanna define sinful pride in this way. When you place yourself above others and deny the need for God, when you elevate yourself, when you exalt yourself above other people and you deny the need for God, that's sinful pride. And Jesus is saying to those who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down at others, here's a story for them. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So we have a religious elite and a tax collector who who was known to be a very bad guy. Um, And he says this, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector right here. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all I get, but the tax collector stood at a distance and look at how he prays. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. If we look at the definition of sinful pride, it's what the Pharisee did. He elevated himself above others. He denied his need for God, while the tax collector said, God, here I am. I'm a sinner. I need your mercy. And he showed a desperation and a dependence and a humility Towards God. Today, I wanna to talk about three different types of pride. Three different types of pride. The first type of pride is I'm better than you pride. I'm better than you pride. The Pharisee demonstrated this very clearly right away. God, thank you I'm not like those people. God, thank you I'm not a stealer. God, thank you that I don't have many speeding tickets. God, thank you uh, that I'm not a Lakers fan or a Seahawks fan <laughs> like Pastor Jordan is. God, thank you that I'm not like those other people. Oh, and God, especially thank you that this tax collector right here, he's a terrible guy. Thank you that I'm not like him. He had a, I'm better than you pride. This Pharisee was actually expressing this attitude of my will be done, not thy will be done. And he looked at this tax collector and said, thank God I'm not like him. And this is the truth. The Pharisee probably thought what he was doing was right. He was praying. But was he? Was he actually praying? Because in reality, he was just talking to himself. In reality, he was just praying to himself. In reality, he never mentioned God one time, but he was putting other people down. Pride is difficult to detect, and it's dangerously destructive. Because Jesus said that this man would not be 
justified. So I'm better than you, Pride. And maybe you think, well, well, I'm not like a Pharisee. I can't relate to that. I know I struggle with I'm better than you, Pride, at times. And I think if we were to be super honest and we would look into our own lives, we would see areas where we have this I'm better than you, Pride. I would never, I would never watch The Bachelor. It's not holy at all. (laughs) Turn on the church network or something. I, I would never, I would never wear that thing. I would never drink that drink. I would never vote for that person. Isn't it easy to have I'm better than you pride? But the scary, dangerous part of having I'm better than you pride is that we give credit to our own character, we give credit to our own success, we give credit to our own glory, and what happens when we do that is it's a, a very easy to begin to despise other people for their faith journey. So I'm better than you, pride. It can't exist with being a Christ follower. As you know that uh, the term Christian, it just means to be a little Christ, a, a little Jesus, I don't know if you're prideful like me, like I don't wanna be a snack-sized Jesus, I wanna be a big Jesus, right? But, but the term little Christian is little Christ and there's a humility there that we wouldn't exalt ourselves, we wouldn't elevate ourselves, but we would be humble to follow Jesus, that we would be like Jesus. So our focus shouldn't be being bigger or better than our neighbor. Our focus shouldn't be being more correct than our friends on social media. Our focus should be being little Christ. And Jesus was humble. Jesus was patient. Jesus was slow to a hurry. Jesus was, was caring to the marginalized and cared for the sick and sat with sinners and loved every single person. If we wanna be little Christ, I'm better than you, pride can't exist. So we have to humble ourselves. That's the first type of pride is I'm better than you. The second one is this, I can handle this pride. I can handle this pride. I know this all too well. I told you recently I became a dad and I remember preparing to be, um, preparing for baby Rome and, and we got so many books and resources and blog recommendations and I was like, nah, I think I got this. <laughs> I think I can handle this. I can do this on my own. I did go to two birthing classes and watch some YouTube, Dad 101. So I am ready for this. I can handle this. In the first few days, Rome was born. I remember being in the hospital and I had some wins under my belt, guys. Like he started crying and, and, and I didn't grow up in the church. So I, I want him to love church. I want him to love Jesus. And so he would start crying and I would sing, Jesus loves you, this I know. And it worked, he stopped crying. Then I picked him up one time and he stopped crying. I was like, I am the baby whisperer. (laughs) I got this. I can handle this. I can handle this. I did not know what the next few weeks would entail. (laughs) I would face great difficulties and on the other side of those difficulties was a smelly, angry, stinky, (laughs) angry, crying, smelly, stinky baby. But I had this, I can handle this, I got this, I'm the baby whisperer, I'm, dad, I'm gonna be the best dad ever. And so he starts to cry and we start to have difficulties and I was just trying to give Kate a break. Like she needs like even a five minute nap will do. She have a little bit of time to herself and so I would hold Rome and things would be going well. Then all of a sudden he would start crying like crazy. He would lose his mind. And so I have a few wins under my belt. I go to what I know, Jesus loves me. It's not working. Jesus, okay, he really doesn't wanna hear about Jesus today. He really does not wanna sing this song. So I go down to the next thing on my list, which is, it's okay, don't, don't cry. No, 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 don't, don't cry. And I don't know about you, but that never works, right? <laughs> so he's crying, he's losing his mind, and Kate's like peeking her head out the door like, do you need help? And I'm like, I got this, babe, go back to sleep. It's fine, I can handle this, I think. I don't know, I, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I got this, I got this. And eventually she would come just swoop him up and do like a boom, boom, bounce, pat, m- maneuver, <laughs> and he's out. Stop crying, he's out like a light. I'm like, wow, humbled. But, but I had this, I can handle this pride, right? So I can handle this. I, th- I think I can handle this. Don't tell anybody, but I, I think I can handle this. But in reality, I really needed help. Church, have you been here? Have you had this type of pride that's, I can handle this, 
I can do this. I think I can do this. I need to show my kids I can do this. I need to show my spouse I can do this. I need to show that I am strong, that I can persevere. And I don't know if it's your life experience. I don't know if it's how your parents raised you. I don't know if it's just the fact that culture teaches us that when we ask for help or when we're not okay, it's a sign of weakness. But in reality, when we bottle this in and we say, I can handle this, and we never ask for help and we never admit that we're not okay, it's actually hurtful to us and the people around us. And it's that I can, I can handle this pride. And when we do that, It's difficult to detect because we feel like we're doing the right thing. We're trying to persevere. We're trying to have strength. We're trying to provide for our family. We're trying to be a rock for our family. It's difficult to detect. And then it's dangerously destructive because when we bottle that in and we try to do everything on our own strength, it becomes about our own performance. It becomes about what we can do. It becomes about our achievements. It becomes about our career when in reality, life and our relationship with Jesus is not about doing, but it's about being with a God who created you, who loves you, who knitted you in your mother's womb. And this is great news for you and I, is that God didn't create you just for you to do stuff for him. He created you so that you can know him and be known by him. Me and Kate, we didn't create Rome for him to do stuff for us. We didn't make him so that he can pay my electric bill. That'd be awesome though, right? (laughs) We didn't make Rome. The other day I had to go get an oil change. It took about an hour and a half. I waited in line on a Saturday, rookie mistake. Imagine if I could have just sent Rome to get my oil change. That'd be awesome. But we didn't create Rome so that he could do something for us. We created Rome so that we can be with him. God wants to be with you. And part of being with you is comforting you, but it's also helping you. God's greatest desire, church, is to protect you. It's to help you. It's to guide you. It's to lead you. It's to love you. That's why the Holy Spirit is described as a comforter, as a counselor, but also as a helper. Because God wants to help us. But when we have, I can handle this pride, he can't help us. We have to create room to allow him to help us. I love reading bumper stickers. There's some wild bumper stickers in the town of Gilbert. It's like, this mom loves minions, or he is greater than I, or the cliche classic. God won't give you anything you can't handle. Is that true? I I don't think that's true because there's a lot of things that I can't handle in my life. And I think the narrative should change. I think they should make new bumper stickers that say, God won't give you anything he can't handle. God won't give you anything that he hasn't ordained because he's all powerful, all knowing, he's all loving. And so I think as a church, as a community, what what if we, what if this world had more people that would say, I can't handle this, but God can. I can't handle this financial crisis, but God can. I can't handle losing my job, but God can. I can't handle this rift in my marriage, but God can. I can't handle this sin and struggle, but God can. Church, our response to God's ability, it begins to form humility in our life, and humility tears down pride. Humility takes away pride and allows us to walk in what God has for us. The Pharisee, he prayed And not one time did he ask for forgiveness. Not one time did he repent. Not one time did he ask for mercy or grace. But the tax collector, the guy who probably doesn't know how to pray, the the guy that probably doesn't know church lingo, the guy who probably is struggling, he he says, "I'm I'm a sinner, I need mercy. The tax collector showed a desperation and a dependence that I'm not okay, I can't handle this. I need your help. Those are the first two types of pride. I'm better than you, I can handle this. Maybe you're here and you go, these two don't apply to me. Well, this third one is for you. This doesn't apply to me, pride. <laughs> this doesn't apply to me, pride. Uh, I, I the, the Pharisee, he, he demonstrated this as well because he didn't pray. He didn't, like I said, he didn't ask for forgiveness. He didn't seek God. So he's saying, this doesn't apply to me, I give I tithe, I fast twice a week. I relate, I relate to this, and maybe you relate to this too, where you give advice or you, you preach something or you tell somebody to do something. 
um, but maybe you haven't done that thing. And maybe that's because you can't relate, or maybe it's because you think it doesn't apply to you. I know for me, I've been a pastor um, for the last eight years, and I grew up with some childhood trauma and difficulties, and um, when I became a Christian, uh, it was amazing. I found new life, I found a heavenly father, I found grace and redemption, and God began to use me to pastor his people. And as I would pastor people and I would pastor students, I would meet with students and I'd hear about their anxiousness, I would hear about their struggles, I would hear about what's going on in their life and I would encourage them, talk to a leader, talk to your parent, pray about it, talk about it. And then if you, if you feel like you need it, counseling is a great resource. Counseling is a great thing to do. And as I reflected on that, um, over, the next, over the last few years of my life, there'd be times where I'd have anxiety flare up, uh, probably for the first time ever in my life. There'd be times where I'd have doubt and uh, I'd have stress management issues and it began to impact my life and leadership. And I realized, I was like, man, I tell students, I tell people that counseling is a good resource. It's a good thing. It shows that you're seeking help that you may not be okay, but you're looking to be okay, that you don't wanna stay in the season that you're in, but you wanna progress. You wanna be healthy so that you can walk in the fullness of God, but also you can impact the people around you. And so I realized I have this doesn't apply to me pride towards counseling because I have the, the, these anxiety moments. And so recently this year, I actually started counseling and it's been awesome. And, and the, the reality is, is I looked at my life and was like, I, I wanna be healthier, I wanna be a great husband, I wanna be a great father, but I also wanna be able to pastor for the long haul. I don't wanna be another statistic. So I wanna be proactive and realize that this does apply to me. <laughs> so I got help and it's been awesome. It's been, a, it's been a great journey. This doesn't apply to me, pride. Have you experienced that? Have you dealt with that? You know who, who has really dealt with this doesn't apply to me, pride? is a guy named Peter in scripture, he was a disciple of Jesus and, and uh, he was following Jesus and days before Jesus would die on a cross, he, he told Peter, said, you're gonna deny me three times. Peter's like, Jay, me? No, can't be, this doesn't apply to me. Jesus, I'm offended. I'm going to deny you three times? I work a lot harder than those guys. I follow you. Oh, no, 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 there's no way. I would never deny you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but if I'm Peter, I'm a little bit insecure and self-conscious. The guy who turned water to wine, the guy who's been predicting a lot of things, is telling me I'm gonna deny him three times. Spoiler alert, he does. Peter does deny Jesus three separate times. Jesus would go and take the cross, die a criminal's death, of a blameless, sinless life. Before people got word of the resurrection, I wonder if Peter saw or thought about the crucifixion and he saw the cross. And when he thought about the cross, he thought about his pride. And that pride led to shame. And now Peter looks at the cruci crucifixion, he looks at the cross and he's sitting in an immense amount of shame. You wanna know who knows pride, it's Peter. And that pride led him to an immense amount of shame. After Jesus rose again, the tomb was empty. Jesus would make appearances, appearances to people. And there's this beautiful scene at the end of the Gospel of John where some of the disciples are fishing and some guy from the shore is like, move your net a little bit that way. And they catch like hundreds of fish and they're like, whoa. We could have just tried that. There's no way. Is that Jesus? Peter hops out of the boat. He starts swimming like Michael Phelps. He's going crazy towards Jesus. He's running towards him. He gets to the beach, realizes it's Jesus. And then there's this beautiful scene of Jesus cooking breakfast for his disciples. And there's an interaction between Jesus and Peter. And in this moment, Peter is forgiven. In this moment, Peter realizes that he has redemption and restoration, and Peter would go on to be a pivotal foundation to the early church movement. Now, knowing that Peter knows pride, let's look at what he writes in 1 Peter chapter five. So put away 
all pride from yourselves. You are standing under the powerful hand of God. At the right time, he will lift you up. Give all your worries to him because he cares for you. He cares for you. But all, put your, all your pride away. Peter knew that he needed to be humble. Peter knows what it looks like to be humble, to put our pride aside so that we can experience the restoration and the redemptive power of Jesus. Today, church, we have to put that pride aside and it really takes some humility to look ourselves in the mirror and go, where is that pride, God? So in a few moments, we're actually gonna take some time to reflect, take some time to worship, and we're gonna take uh, time to do communion together as a church. But before we get into that, I have some questions to ask you or questions that you can ask during this time. God, where do I have I'm better than you pride? Where do I have pride that I elevate myself above others? I, I spend more time judging people. I spend more time belittling people. I spend more time despising other people for their journey. Uh, number two is where do I have I can handle this pride? Where do I have pride where I'm not willing to get help or I'm just, uh, maybe I'm too prideful to admit that I, I need some help, that I need strength from God, that I need, I need more dependence or desperation for him. God, where do I have I can handle this pride? Where am I carrying too much of a burden where you say your burden is easy, it's light, I'll carry stress, I'll carry anxiety for you if you would just give it to me. Peter says, give all your worries to him because he cares for you. So where do you have I can handle this pride? And then the last one, where do you have this doesn't apply to me pride? You know what this doesn't apply to me pride is? is it's picking and choosing what commands God gives that you follow. It's picking and choosing what you give to God to trust. It's picking and choosing. It's having a closed, closed mind mindset. This doesn't apply to me pride. What that looks like is, I know Jesus came to serve and not be served, but somebody else, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will meet that need. Somebody else will go serve the community. I know Jesus, he, he withdrew often to lonely places to pray. I know Jesus took time to rest and take naps and eat. I know Jesus practiced Sabbath. But me, I have too many work projects. I have a deadline coming up. I have a career to chase. So I, I can't be present on the weekends. I gotta keep working. This doesn't apply to me. I know Jesus was about all people. I know Jesus was in the community. I know Jesus was in the neighborhood. Jesus was in dining rooms with people who he, people thought he would never sit with. But, but me, I, I'm, too, I'm too busy. This doesn't apply to me. Where do we, church, where do we have that? Where do we have this, this doesn't apply to me pride? And I think it comes down to knowing that God humbled himself that Jesus took on flesh and bones and he experienced the emotions and the temptations and the, the things that we can encounter in life. Jesus experienced those things, but he displayed a perfect life for you and for me. And he laid down his life so that we could find ours, so that we could have a full life that will have sufferings and it'll have difficulties. But God wants us to be forgiven. God wants us to be made whole again. God wants to spend eternity. He wants to be in a relationship with you and I. So he took the cross. And what I love about communion is it's this remembrance of what God has done for us. And it's us coming together as a body of people called the church, remembering what Jesus has done for us. On the night Jesus was captured, he gathered with his disciples and they began to share a meal. And he talked about how his body would be broken so that we could be made whole again. His body would be broken for us. He would take the cross. He would die in a gruesome death. And we take this bread in remembrance that his body was broken for us. So church this morning, Christ's body broken for you and I in an act of humility. That's what Jesus did for us. Let's take and eat in remembrance of
Christ's body broken for us. Shortly after Jesus would talk about the forgiveness of our sins and what the cup represents is his blood that was shed for us that wipes us clean, that forgives us of our sins. It's the cup of the new covenant. So when we take the cup of Christ, it's in remembrance of his blood shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. Church, the Christ of cup, drink in remembrance of what he's done for us. Lord, we come to you this morning with a heart posture of humility. And I pray, Lord, that we remember uh, that those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted, be justified by God. So this morning, I pray, Lord, that we put all our pride aside, we put all our pride away, and we begin to grow in our humility. I pray that we can get real and honest, that we can take these next few moments to pause and pray, to look into our life and ask God, where do I have pride and would you remove it? Maybe for some of you that's saying, I'm better than you pride and I I pray God that you would begin to use me to impact your people and and I know that 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 type of pride just can't exist. So God, would you remove that from my life? Maybe it's you, you struggle with, I can handle this pride. This morning, I pray for you. I pray that you would be relieved from the burden that you're carrying, the weight that you shouldn't carry on your own. But there's a dependence and a desperation towards God and God is willing to help you. God wants to help you. It's his greatest desire. So this morning, I pray for you. If that's you, I pray that God would remove that from your life so that you can walk freely, so that you can walk in joy, so that you can experience the amazing things that God has for you. Maybe you're hearing you have, this doesn't apply to me, pride. You struggle with that, as do I. I pray for you. I pray that you would begin to realize that there's moments, there's, there's areas in my life where things do apply and I need to get real and honest. And God, I need you to remove that pride in my life. God, I pray that we remember that pride is difficult to detect and it's dangerously destructive And God, it's not a part of your will. So I pray, Lord, that we begin to humble ourselves. Remind us that Jesus came to serve and not be served. Remind us that in some of his last few moments, Jesus would get down on his feet, get down on his hands and knees, and he would wash the disciples' feet. Remind us that Jesus laid down his life in an act of humility, putting all pride aside so that we can be in relationship with the Father. God, we, we practice communion in remembrance, your body broken for us and your blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. We praise you. We thank you. God, I pray that you move in the, our hearts in these next few moments of worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to worship one more time together, so if you would stand. This is my soul. 